In the early 90s, Maurice Strong, who's a big player with the United Nations, he's been head of the World Bank before and a few other divisions, and he was sent over to China uh, to set up the office to help uh, get the World Trade Organization, using your tax money to get the factories, the physical factories, all set up all over China and to get all the, the Western countries to fund all of that, which we did. We fund for the transfer of your own factories abroad. And... Uh, he, they pulled him out of there and brought him to Canada for a couple of years uh, to privatize the, the electrical systems for Ontario and made him chairman of the board. And in the Toronto Sun, he had said back then, he said that there will be coming power shortages. Uh, uh, and, of course, he said uh, uh, main factories that are left are very important government um, uh, offices, offices and so on will all have diesel energy backups etc to ensure they continue but he says this is definitely coming these power shortages they already had a plan this austerity remember idea uh, f- from before even he came along and said that in the era 90s so with that in mind here is um, an article today BBC News 2011 is crucial year for the UK energy it says here, it's a video, I'll put this link up for you to watch. It says, the UK is about to embark on a huge process of change in the way it produces, transports and uses energy. Steve Holliday, chief executive of National Grid, explains how 2011 is the crucial decision point for investment decisions that will have huge long-term implications for the UK's energy policies. Now, Murray Strong taught in the 90s about rationing it, you see, and that's what, of course, is coming. And John uh, O'Sullivan uh, also has this article here on the same thing. Power supplier admits going green will put the lights out in Britain. British families have been told the shocking truth about the price of green energy. They must prepare to go without electricity for extended periods, warns the UK's top electricity boss. Steve Halliday, National Grid's chief executive, issued a stark warning over the consequences of the UK going green, speaking to, to listeners to, uh, on today's uh, Radio 4 Today, it's called Radio 4 Today program. The link's there if you want to listen to it. The shock admission was immediately picked up by the Daily, Daily Telegraph in the article, Era of Constant Electricity at Home is Ending, says Power Chief. Britain's largest energy supplier, National Grid, is one of the most lucrative privatized monopolies in the world. It deals with the cold realities uh, to a nation already committed to spending £18 billion pounds per year on unnecessary, unpopular green taxes. You're going to be taxed into the ground. Are you, getting the, 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 are you beginning to see why this massive build-up of internal militarized police has been going on for years? You know what's coming down the pike, and they know what's coming down the pike. And they've got a lot more to push on you. An awful lot more to push in you. And they're all ready for it too. Because it was planned a long, long time ago. So the Brits were told, wind, wind turbines, you're, you're going to get them whether you like it or not. The colossal company is hell bent in pursuing an ill-conceived agenda to make its energy policy more environmentally friendly by focusing on wind power. Well, I'll jump from there and I'll put another article up. This is, this is from Mail Online. Why the 250 billion pounds 250 billions. This is a country that's been ransacked, plundered, raped by the banks, raped by the, the governments, raped by the EU, the, the, the European Union. And here they go, just, just putting, it's like sticking the bayonet in at the end after you've shot someone, uh, sticking the bayonet in and twisting it as much as you can to get the last grunt out of them. Why the 250 billion pound wind uh, power industry could be the greatest scam of our age. And here are the three lies that prove it by Christopher Brooker. It says, Scarcely a day goes by without more evidence to show why the government's obsession with wind turbines, now at the centre of our national energy policy, is one of the greatest political blunders of our time. Under a target agreed with the EU, Britain is committed within 10 years at astronomic expense to generating nearly a third of its electricity from renewable sources, mainly through building thousands more wind turbines. But the penny is finally dropping for almost everyone, except the politicians, that to rely on windmills to keep our lights on is a colossal and a very dangerous act of self-deception. And we'll go in and explain why that is this big, massive con that's coming to place near you across the world. Back after this.
Hi folks, we're back. And this is Cutting Through the Matrix. I'm talking about the inefficiency of the wind turbines. And this article goes on to say, it says, take for example the 350 foot monstrosity familiar to millions of motorists who drive past it as sluggishly as it sluggishly revolves about the, above the M4 outside Reading. This wind turbine performs so poorly, working at only 15% of its capacity, that the £130,000 government subsidy given to its owners was more than the £100,000 worth of electricity it actually produced last year. Meanwhile, official figures have confirmed that during these freezing, windless weeks around Christmas, when electricity demand was at record levels, the contribution made by Britain's 3,500 turbines was minuscule. It says, uh, to keep the homes warm, we were having to import vast amounts of power from nuclear reactors in France. That's because they won't let them have them in Britain. Wind turbines are so expensive that Holland recently became the first country uh, in Europe to abandon its EU renewable energy target, announcing that it is to slash its annual subsidy by billions of euros. So unpopular wind turbines, and except for the guys that are making them and getting the government contracts, eh, that our own government has just offered bribes to local communities in the form of lower council tax and electricity bills. Well, don't take the bribe, because once you're all on it, they'll jack up the price again. In Scotland, the 800 residents of the beautiful island of Tyree are desperately trying to resist Alex Salmon's plans to railroad through what will be the largest offshore wind farm in the world, covering 139 square miles off their coast which they say will destroy their community by driving away the tourists who provide much of their living. So little riddled with environmental hypocrisy is the lobbying for wind energy that a recent newspaper report exposed the immense human and ecological catastrophe being inflicted on northern China by the extraction of the rare earth minerals needed to make the giant magnets that every turbine in the West uses to generate its power. They're always fixing them too. It costs more to maintain them than, than, than what, how, it, how it produces. Here in a nutshell are some of the reasons why people are beginning to wake up to the horrific downside of the wind business. And since I, I began writing about wind turbines nine years ago, I've come to see how the case for them rests on three great lies. By the way, uh, the big CFR boys and the Fabians were talking about wind turbines back in the 1920s to come. And, and H.G. E. Wells wrote about them if you think this is just happening by chance. It says that the first is the pretense that turbines are anything other than ludicrously inefficient. The most glaring dishonesty dishonesty peddled by the wind industry and echoed by gullible politicians is vastly to exaggerate the output of turbines by deliberately talking about them only in terms of their capacity as if this was what they actually produce. Rather, it's the total amount of power they have the capability of producing. The point about wind, of course, is that it is constantly varying in speed so that the output of the turbines averages out at barely barely a quarter of their capacity at any one time. This means that the 1,000 megawatts all those 3,500 turbines sited around the country feed on average into the grid is derisory, no more than the output of a single medium-sized conventional power station. Furthermore, as they increase in number and the government wants to see 10,000 more of them in the next few years, it will quite farcically become necessary to build a dozen or more gas-fired power stations running all the time and emitting CO2 simply to provide instant backup for when the wind drops. It's true, isn't it? It's so crazy. The second great lie about wind power is a pretense that it's not a preposterously expensive way to produce electricity. No one would dream of building wind turbines unless they were guaranteed a huge government subsidy. This comes in the form of the Renewables Obligation Certificate Subsidy Scheme paid for through household bills, whereby owners of wind turbines earn an additional £49 for every megawatt hour they produce and twice that sum for offshore turbines. That's why so many people are now realizing the wind bonanza, almost entirely dominated in Britain by French, German, Spanish and other foreign-owned firms, is one of the greatest scams of our age. And the third great lie is that the industry is somehow making a vital contribution to saving the planet by cutting emissions of CO2, because it's not. What other industry gets a public subsidy equivalent to 100 or even 200% of the value of what it produces? See, it's corporate welfare. It's corporate. That's where the real welfare is, the big bucks. Not the people at the bottom who lose their jobs. We may, we may not be aware of just how much we are pouring into the pockets of the wind developers because our bills hide this from us. But as ever more turbines are built, 
This could soon be adding hundreds of pounds a year to the bills. When a Swedish firm recently opened what is now the world's largest offshore wind farm off the coast of Kent at a cost of 800 million pounds, we were told that its capacity was 300 megawatts, enough to provide green power for tens of thousands of homes. What we're not told is that its actual output will average only 80 megawatts, a tenth of that supplied by gas-fired power stations, for which we will all be paying a subsidy of £60 million a year, or £1.5 billion over the next 25-year lifespan of the turbines. And on and on and on it goes. Because, again, like everything else in this world, it's a big scam. A big scam, folks. You see, again, too, it only worked, too, if they did kill off an awful lot of the population and have a smaller population down the road. And even that smaller population would have to earn so much to pay off in taxes to keep these darn things going in the first place. It, would, it wouldn't be feasible. But this is the nonsense we're fed. And, of course, the big uh, sharks, the big psychopathic sharks who own industries and investments, they smell it coming and they're in like a shot to make sure they get their fair share of all the blood that's spilt from the taxpayer. Back with more after this break. <laughs> <laughs> 